the revolution was Twitter, there was Facebook, there was text message, there was blog. But I have, I have serious disagreements when we want to call it the Twitter revolution because first, it confuses what's a medium, what the actual causes, but also because it would be drastically unfair to a lot of the people who are out there on the square who may have never used a computer before, but who own this revolution as much as anybody else, as much as the rest of us. Um, and that is not to belittle the role of, of social media during this revolution. And it was it's a role that was quite widely recognized. Time magazine gave um, social media users a cover. Newsweek spoke of a, of a keystroke revolution. Enigma magazine Egypt spoke of a Twitterati. And they were widely quoted by the, by the mainstream media, um, sometimes without double checking the facts, which is a whole other topic on, it, on itself. But it's only recognition, I think, to those tools that even the leading journalists, like those guys working for mainstream media were borrowing those tools and were using them and were tweeting, reporting from the ground before their reports to their newsrooms. This is Dahlia Square, one of the uh, craziest days that we had. And sometimes it, it seemed to me that the stories that came out of it was a bit of an, of an aerial view, of a general view. Didn't, see the real stories because every single one of those people is a story and they, have, they, wanted, they wanted to share something with you. And even though you know, everybody on the ground had a phone, and I mean everybody, um, people were very creative when it came to recharging phones, by the way. They would hook them up to, to, hook them up to you know, nearby houses when people would be kind enough to give them an extension to stores. Some people hooked plugs to lampposts. They opened the thing, got a wire out, and of their phones, it was, it was extremely creative. But it, sometimes it seemed that they focused more on reporting this kind of news, the fighting, the minute-to-minute -minute events, which is a big part of it. But, oh, and by the way, the army didn't like it very much when we did that. That was my phone before an army officer decided to kill it. But I'd like to tell you a little more about a few of the people that I came across on Tahrir Square and who are, are heroes to me and people who inspired me, whom I learned from. The gentleman, for instance, in, in, in the middle, um, his name is Ahmed, and his son was Islam. He was 26, and he was shot by a police sniper on January 29th. It was a Saturday. And he was right next to him, and he told me that I was next to him and I could not protect him, and that was my job. And Ahmed vowed to not leave Tahrir Square until, until Mubarak was gone, until he had retribution for his son. I like to think that he did go home, and, February 11th. This is Khadiga. I asked her why she was demonstrating. And so she starts with this long list of, of grievances, of things that, that, are, that she cares about. From her father, who has been a 29-year public doctor and his mediocre salary, um, she told me about this, this vicious state security officer in her hometown who targets young women, arrests them, and then threatens to rape them, just to frighten them. She told me about the, the shameful position of the Egyptian state when, when it came to the blockade on Gaza. She was impressive. She's 19. Yeah, I don't know, I think you can, you can see in her eyes that she was smiling. <laughs> this is Hannah, and Hannah's a school teacher, and she demonstrated for the first few days until the first speech of Mubarak, which gave a few concessions. And she was satisfied, so she decided to, to go home. But she told me that she went back to Tahrir Square after witnessing, after watching the attacks of, of while well, the government hired thugs on us on Tahrir Square. They sent leagues of, of thugs, armed, riding horses and camels. Wallahi, camels, they were riding camels. And she came back to Tahrir Square and she said that anybody who does that to their people does not deserve to stay. And this is Goma. And his son, Abdurrahman, he's 12, and he helps at the bakery after school, I checked. And I met them at their bakery one day after curfew, and people were still queuing in front of the bakery. And I said, well, are you going to close at all? There's a curfew. You should, you know, you're exposing yourself to something. He said, bread is as important as hospitals. I will not close today until every single person has been served. Now, these people and many others they had, they had a message that they wanted to share, and well, they, they expressed it in many ways. They were quite creative about it sometimes, but I mean, think of it, we're a population that has been bottled up for 30, 60 years perhaps, and when it came to saying, 
it had a lot to say. There's a full page of text and not three words as you see on the banner. And that's very symptomatic. That's very expressive of what it is to be kept in silence when you had so much to speak about. I thought, I thought, that, was, I thought that was amazing. Uh, some people used humor. And I don't know if you, can, if you can read those, but the one on the right says, leave already, I miss my wife. <laughs> and the one on the left says, also addressing Mubarak, said, go ahead, don't worry, we'll find you another job. Uh, yeah, I think we had the funniest revolution in the world. Um, but <laughs> but also, no, and beyond the humor, I, what I also like about this picture is that these people are addressing the present. They're addressing the former president. I love saying former president. They're addressing the former president directly, which is quite new for us. When writing in Arabic wasn't enough, or when he didn't seem to get in Arabic, they wrote in other languages. When words were not enough, they drew. Hi. Just for those who may, those who don't know the joke, for the one on the very left, the, uh, the laughing cow thing is one of the oldest nicknames that Egyptians have had for Hosni Mubarak. And we say it in French with an Egyptian accent, it's Labashkiri. When paper didn't seem to be enough, they wrote on their bodies. And when that didn't seem to the trick, people like Henny wrote on walls. Henny's the graffiti artist, he's 23, and he was, uh, he was tagging on the back of the Mugamma, which those who have been to Cairo know that it's the sternest government building in the country. And he was telling me about how, how a raw form of expression graffiti art is. And he's really, really good, by the way. Um, and he was hoping that that would be a recognized form of art in, in the new Egypt. Other people more, more artistically inclined, like, like Rami Sang, Rami's a beautiful story. He's 23. Uh, Rami asked Thomas his name. They call him the good revolution singer because after the first couple of days, he came from his hometown of Mansoura and he stayed in Cairo. And he was there day in, um, day out, day and night. He was singing to people on stages, on the street. He's extremely creative. And um, on March 9th, which is about a month after uh, Hosni Mubarak was deposed, he was actually arrested and tortured by the army overnight. So, but he's recovering well, I'm, I'm happy to say, and he's actually, last week, the past week, he was back on Tahrir Square and he was singing. So, so we're happy that he's back. Um, but you don't, you don't have to be particularly artistically creative to, to speak up. Right? I mean, there are the people who are on the ground, people like this man who are literally, literally on the ground, their message was, was audible enough, their message was loud enough. They, they said their message by being there, by sitting there, by sitting under a tank, or by not being afraid of a police attack coming from here or there, or you know, by standing together with other people that they had not known, or people like these guys. A guy brought his son, and they were staying overnight on the square. I like to think that we heard them loud and clear. So what I would like to, would like to maybe close on is invite you that when you're, when you're watching an event like that, especially something where the news are coming in extremely quickly, try to silence the fights and the burning stuff and look for the, for, for the little stories, look for the people who are the heart and soul of, of every movement, of every event. Because they have a message and they would love to share it with you. And for us, well, I think we like, if only for that little revolutionary who was in the square, we have to believe, as, as this, this one wrote, that which means what's coming is, is better. It's not over yet, but it will be better, so we hope. Thank you very much.